in their veins. Mackie and Chad on Score North and scorenorth.com. Is there any common thread, anything you put a finger on, and you guys losing leads? I mean, it's happened pretty much over the last month or so. Yeah, we didn't do good. At, at, uh, we had a chance to put the game away uh, after the turnover. We didn't do good there, and then uh, we haven't been good in, in a um, two-minute drill on defense. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. That's a Thanks, that's a, that's a that's simplified it. way of of saying it. If you're Mike Zimmer, if you missed Vikings vent line yesterday, it was another great therapy session. Thanks to all of you guys. I mean, we definitely got some things off our chest, but um, it's always great when we can just sit back, sit back and be therapists for you guys, Vikings fans. So if you missed it, be sure to check out Vikings vent line on Purple Daily or the Purple Daily YouTube channel. This is Mackie and Judd. Daily Minnesota sports entertainment and therapy. We just want championships. You know, that's all we want. Mm-hmm. Just uh, just want just want some more titles around here. You know, celebrating the Twins every five years. 1991 is great and all, but uh, you know those guys are pretty old now. So uh, we just like to raise the expectations. Should we just get right into statements here, boys? Uh-huh. I-, I have a feeling that all three of us just have more. There's more meat on the bone from yesterday's loss to the Baltimore Ravens and. I think oh, there's yeah. the music, so let's let's hit it here. All right, Judd right. Zolga, why don't you why don't you tee off here? Hit the breakfast ball for us. Lead off, yeah. Okay, I don't. Again, for the second consecutive week, I don't care about one game because to me the problems run so much deeper than one game. So my statement is going to be from uh, ten thousand feet above, and say that I have found clarity. Last night I found clarity. Uh, I've been on the fence about what's going to occur here, but now I'm positive. Rick Spielman and Mike. Zimmer both need to be gone at the end of this season. I don't trust either one. I don't think – I think they took their shots, and so there was a time when I deemed them to be very competent. But as far as where this franchise is going moving forward, I don't trust either one. The GM um, cannot identify a quarterback. Uh, I don't know if he's being pushed around now by the coach or what, but the incompetence of the coaching staff here – in key, key areas, i.e. offense, um, is off the charts. I no longer trust the people who are in charge with making the football-y football decisions for the Minnesota Vikings LLC, and therefore they both need to be gone. I realize it's drastic, but I would rather bring in a GM who has fresh ideas and who I trust going forward and allow him to bring in the next coach and then they can decide on Kirk Cousins. Oh, hey, Kirk Cousins is great. Or, you know what, not so great. Uh, But after watching this team and how it continues to operate in a season that started with great expectations, and by the way, justified, justified expectations, And to see them blow game after game after game in the apologist attempt to say, but the games are so close, Judd, you know what? At some point in time, bad teams don't win close games, and the Vikings have turned themselves into a bad team. I'm done with the GM. I'm done with the coach. Hit the reset button. So do you think, so that's what you think, do you think the Wilfs are there with both? I think they're there with Zimmer. Do you think they're there with Rick? I think they need to be. I think they need to be advised, if nothing else, um, that you can't watch this and watch the product and watch how it's unfolding and not at least be getting very close. Um, I just don't. Why would you trust Rick at this point in time to uh, continue to um, make roster moves? He traded a fourth round pick for a tight end who's now behind some guy named Luke Stacker. Um, the yeah, quarterback, the quarterback <laughs> conundrums continue. The coach, uh, who is definitely under Rick's control, is out of control. So, I really hope that the Wilfs are getting to the point where they need to get to, which is to say, this team it doesn't need a rebuild, but it needs a very hard reset. Turn the computer off. Allow it to reset, turn it back on, see what happens. You know, all right, here's where I'm at. I feel, I feel like, so you just said it. I think we've been kind of trying to feel our way around this conversation. And I, I think I think we've, over the last couple of weeks, I think you and I have both come to the same place on Zimmer. And, and I've been more of a Zimmer defender throughout the years than you have. I think you've always turned a side eye at some of his antics. And I've always said, yeah, but like he, he's like, train wreck proof you know like his worst seasons are seven and nine and then he did go to an nfc championship game but it's very obvious as a leader 
And as an all-encompassing head coach, he's not the guy if you want to win a Super Bowl. If you want to guard against going 3-13, and 13, if you're the Jets or you're some other crappy franchise, the Texans, you, should, you could do a lot worse than hiring Mike Zimmer to train wreck-proof your franchise. But the Vikings aren't there, man. It's 60 years 60 years of no championships. The goal shouldn't be to avoid 4-12 and 12 or 4-13 and 13 now. The goal should be to win a championship. And I think he is kryptonite to your chances to win a championship. You can't. You can't with a coach that's that bad offensively, that clearly is that bad against winning teams. I mean, he's now projected to be 19-44 and 44 against teams that finish the season with a winning record. Where I hesitate, I agree with a lot of the Rick Spielman criticism as well. I think by and large, he's built good competitive rosters over the last 10 to 15 years in his front office roles. I don't think he's an elite general manager. I worry that firing everyone is going to lead to whiffing on some hires. But then again, like if you're not going to win a Super Bowl with the current collection, then what's the fear? You know, right. what's the fear? You got to you got to you got to take a chance if you want to take the next step. And so I've always hesitated when it comes to GM, coach, quarterback. The Vikings are safe in all three of those, right? Like they're they've been good, not elite. But they've, it's not like they got a Geno Smith or some just train wrecky quarterback. Kirk's a good quarterback. Zimmer's a good coach. Spielman's a good GM. But good, good, good isn't going to lead you to a Super Bowl. And so, you know, how aggressive and how risky do you want to be here? I'm ready to be risky. I want to win a Super Bowl. And I don't think this trio, GM, coach, and quarterback, are going right. to win you one. And is Mike still good? Like, Mike was good. I agree. But is Mike still good? Like, I feel like it's disintegrated here. Um, and, and, Rick and Mike also had a really long period of time here to take their shot and to win it all. Or to just get there, right? Um, feels to me like the clock was ticking and now it's buzzed and it's done. Uh, sorry, your time is up. You lose. It just you feels are the weakest way. link. Goodbye. Yeah, it just feels that way. All right. All right. Um, here's my first statement for you guys. Stick with me on this one, okay? If the NFL was a cooking show, the Ravens offense would be cooking with filet mignon and fresh scallops. And the Vikings offense would be microwaving a Salisbury steak TV dinner. Think about yesterday, for example, okay? Just, just, you've got every single week, the Baltimore Ravens, three offensive figureheads get into a room and strategize for every opponent, right? And those three figureheads are John Harbaugh, who's one of the best leaders in the NFL, one of the best, most forward-thinking coaches in the NFL. He took what was a Joe Flacco offense and molded it and, and hired the right people to make it into a Lamar Jackson offense, right? It wasn't, this is how we play offense. It was, okay, we used to have Joe Flacco, and he had his own set of skills or not, and now we have Lamar Jackson. And so, like, John Harbaugh's vision, leadership, et cetera. Greg Roman is the offensive coordinator. He has coordinated a Super Bowl team in the Niners and was one of the more, I would say, forward-thinking innovators with Colin Kaepernick eight, nine years ago. Ten years of offensive NFL experience. He's got innovation badges from his time in San Francisco and now doing what they've been doing the last two or three years with Lamar Jackson. And then Lamar Jackson's the third guy in that room, right? He's one of the most creative and mobile quarterbacks and unique quarterbacks in the NFL. So those three guys put in their heads together. They don't script the first 15 plays anymore because they just want to react to what defenses are going to do because it can change week to week. Meanwhile, think about the same trio in the Vikings room every single week. You've got Mike Zimmer, who's one of the most stubborn, rigid coaches in the NFL, especially with offense, right? He's got his way that he feels like it should be done, and it's just don't screw up. you got Clint Kubiak who has zero experience as a play caller. I mean, he was, we've talked about this a million times, but he was the wide receivers coach at Kansas University five years ago. Certainly wasn't coaching in Super Bowls, right? Like Greg Roman and John Harbaugh. And then you got Kirk Cousins, who's accurate, but he's immobile, he's bad against pressure, and he'd rather defer leadership to the coaches and to the coordinators. He'd rather just be told what to do. And so... It's not a surprise that yesterday, even though the Ravens looked stifled in the first half and the Ravens threw two interceptions, that ultimately the combination of Harbaugh, Roman, Lamar trumped Zimmer, Clint Kubiak, Kirk Cousins. But I would say by a mile, even though the score was close yesterday. Yep. And, and what's just completely inexcusable is this. The Vikings have the 
ingredients to be cooking with many of the same things. Mm -hmm. Not all, but a lot of them that Baltimore has. You've got Justin Jefferson, who is, you know, top-end steak, right? (laughs) You've got Thielen, who is productive, very good. K.J. Osborne. If Dalvin Cook is used right, you know, Dalvin Cook got a 66-yard run on the Vikings' second series on Sunday because the Vikings had set up, in part, the threat of the pass. Oh, my mm-hmm. God, are they going to pass? We, we've got to play that now. And the Vikings shoved it down the Ravens' throat, 66 yards, and proceeded to say, that's our run game. It, so there was one thing that, that Mark Schler said on the game yesterday that should have driven everybody crazy. So he clearly met with Zim before the game Saturday night. And it's two football-y football guys, right? Sitting down to grind tape, talk football, and probably have a couple of tough stakes. And Mark Schlereth at one point said in the first half, that's what the Vikings should do. They should run the ball yeah. the rest of the game. God. That came from Mike. Mm-hmm. Mark Schlereth was parroting his buddy Zimmer. That he, was was praising, the- he was praising Kubiak quite a few times throughout yeah. the game, yes. too, right? But I mean, but clearly Mike told him we are going to run this ball. What? You just had a 50, 50 yard touchdown pass. Well, and the thing Think is, like, that. And, and like they've got <sighs> Dalvin Cook, so you shouldn't just abandon the run. And obviously, oh. it worked on that play. I don't think anyone is advocating for them abandoning the run. But Tyler Conklin, the last two weeks, who is a backup tight end with limited skills, he's good. Like, I'm not saying he's not an NFL player. Like, he's a good player, but he's certainly not a dynamic pass catching threat. Right? He's good, right. not great. He's been targeted 14 times the last two games. Justin Jefferson, nine. Yeah. Out of a bye, in which you did self-scouting for two weeks. (laughs) Inexcusable. Inexcusable. And some of it's schemes, some of it's Kirk Cousins just not wanting to throw into traffic or make a risky throw of some kind. Mike must have sat down with Schlereth and said, we are are just going to run with 33 all day, which is the worst thing that you can do to Dalvin Cook. The threat of the pass is what makes Cook even better. When the Ravens know, oh, these these stooges, these slappies are going to run, guess what they do? They come up in the box, and what did they do in the second half? They stopped the run thoroughly because it was going to be a one-man show. Who the hell thinks that is, uh, oh, this is a good idea, one-man show? Anyway, sorry to... Declan? Uh, I have a Mike Zimmer statement, but after Phil's, I'm actually going to go to my second one. And my second statement is, I want a Lamar Jackson. I want wow. a Lamar Jackson, and I know every they're hard to one. find. Yeah, and you could have had him though Why too. Is Mike Hughes, Mike you could have had him. Uh, Lamar with 380 all-purpose yards, 120 on the ground. Even when things were inefficient for him in that first half, basically, I think at one point he was like six of 15. He was inaccurate. The Vikings defense, kudos to them, actually had a good game plan to to stop him. But guess what? In the second half, when they're down 14 points, so the pressure's on you. He still leads his team down for 21 points in the second half. He's a dual threat quarterback, and yeah, he kind of changes up the whole scheme to the point of of the Salisbury steak and 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 the Ravens basically cooking with a tenderloin, right? Like the Vikings have the cast iron pan, but for whatever damn reason, they're still microwaving a steak, and I have no idea why. And Lamar Jackson comes in, and eventually he might get figured out a little bit because he's a dual threat guy, and these Kaepernick's and Michael Vick's of the world, they, they eventually the book gets out on him. But the Ravens offense who has gone through like five different running backs this year because they've had injuries and ineffectiveness. They pick up Devonta Freeman off the street, and he's still establishing he's fine because they have Lamar bleeping Jackson to run their offense on a dual threat side. And I know Lamar's are hard to find. He's an MVP. He could make a case for him to be winning another MVP this year. But I want a Lamar Jackson. That's the kind of quarterback that I absolutely would love to have because it gives you a completely different edge on an offensive game plan. But without the right coach... Yeah, It doesn't matter. That's the thing. Harbaugh said, okay, we're going to have to change everything here. And then he said, bring it on. We'll do it. So so you can have, I, I mean, the Vikings, Spielman could have said, I am going to take this kid. Damn it, Mike. He is a star. I've seen it. I love him. Lamar Jackson's our guy. The Minnesota Vikings take Lamar Jackson. <laughs> and you know what? If Mike is like, well, that's fine, but I perceive him to be just this or or that, guess what? The Vikings have a guy who is then deemed a disappointment because they didn't change a thing. So so Phil's right. This comes down to, is your coach um, with the times and open-minded enough to morph and change things? And if he's not completely, 
then he should be your ex-coach. On Lamar Jackson, two things here come to mind. I think whenever whenever you get quarterback envy here, it feels like whether it's on Purple Daily or whether you're just you know talking to other Vikings fans, a common response back is, well, you know that like you can't just snap your fingers and create a Patrick Mahomes or a Lamar Jackson. It's like, well, okay, you, right. You're not going to just clone Patrick Mahomes and you're not just going to always like you know, draft a Lamar Jackson, but they don't even try. <laughs> Like, like the Vikings, they did draft Teddy Bridgewater in the first round, which is, you know, that's now, what, seven years ago, six, seven years ago that they made that draft pick. But it's like they're so content. Everyone's so content with Kirk because Kirk's like, you could make an argument that Kirk is like a top 10 quarterback on his best day. Well, there's only 32 teams in the league. We're not talking about just trying to sneak into the playoffs and eke your way above 500. We're talking about what does it take to win a championship? And, you know, if I can make a cross sport comparison, watching that game yesterday, you know, Lamar was getting pressured on a regular basis. It wasn't like he had clean pockets. I mean, the Vikings defense did a really good job stifling him for sure in the first half. And mm-hmm. I would say if if the NFL were the NBA, even though he's getting defenders running at him and he's getting thrown off his spot, like he can still create his own offense, like a Kevin Durant or like a you know, James Harden or a yeah. or Luca. You know, all right, we're going to run defenders at you. We're going to give you weird looks. We're going to try and get the ball out of your hands. And Luca is still going to drop 28 points and eight assists and 10 rebounds, right? And Kirk Cousins is more like the spot up shooter, where like he's like Steve Kerr, or, you know, think of your spot up shooter, where like, dude, if that, if you get that guy eight clean looks, he's going to cash those threes and he's going to look amazing. But if you if you're running him off the line, and if you're throwing double teams at him, and, or if he's taking the ball up the court, and now it's up to you to get into the lane, it doesn't work as well. But if you give him a clean look, he's going to cash the three. But Lamar is so next level, and Kyler is so next level, and Josh Allen, even going back to Week One, Joe Burrow can make plays and create things out of thin air and throw a ball down the field and take a risk, right? Like, right. That's not who Kirk really ever has been, and it's not who he is. So. Um, that's what that was the biggest difference I noticed yesterday is like Lamar threw a couple picks even and just like he's so dynamic and so great he just he just drives the offense regardless. But what should drive everybody crazy is the fact that the Vikings don't even have the infrastructure of coaching to make a Lamar Jackson pick possible right now. Mm-hmm. Like it would it would be a waste of their time to take him because they wouldn't cultivate him, they wouldn't change a thing and it would be a disaster. That's that's the pathetic thing. Like we are we are talking about a guy who has no interest really in offense or his QB. So why are we talking about him still being head coach? Yeah. Uh, all right. Before we get to Judd's next statement here, listen. It's a disappointing, really, season for Vikings fans. But yesterday we had the rare glimpse into an Aaron Rodgers-less Packers team. And so while we sit here and wallow in our tears watching this Vikings team, let's take a brief moment here and celebrate the incompetence of the Green Bay Packers yesterday on national TV. This is Packers Ventline on Mackie and Judd. Go, Pack, go! I mean, he missed throws at D.A., but I did not like D.A.'s attitude looking at that kid and shaking his head and giving all that spaz. I mean... Gary, you're going to go back and watch the film because I know you always do. You get the coach's copy. You go back and look at that, and he's looking right at Jordan, and he's giving them nasty looks. It's like, yo, man, the kid hasn't had any rhythm with you. How is he supposed to hit you all the time? You saw that, right? Oh, heck I did. <laughs> That's what I thought, too, watching that Packers oh, game. I'm like, you know what? If Devontae Adams was just a little more open-minded yeah, about how, Jordan Love, then they would have been great. How great would it be if this franchise got, like, two solid years of just sort of, meh, quarterback play? How great would this be? Like, yeah. when they realize, oh, my God, uh, no Favre, no Rodgers, you know, Jordan Love's not that good. What what a eureka moment it is going to be for that entire state when they see what so many of us have seen for years, which is you occasionally just get a QB who's not that good. I mean, they had the eight-week stretch a few years ago of Brett Hundley, I think, or maybe yeah. Deshaun Kaiser yeah. got a start in there, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they've never had, like, three years. I mean, there's 35-, 40-year-old Packer fans that don't remember 100%. pre-Rodgers, pre 
Brett Favre. Uh, that was Chris and Brookfield, courtesy of our friends on the fan in Milwaukee's Green and Gold postgame show. Uh, let's hear some uh, from some more sad Packers fans here, Declan. Go, Pat, go! I pretty much, you know, knew Jordan Love. I mean, we saw what he is today. He's, he's horrible. Yes, he I don't think I don't think horrible is the word. One here's, for ten on third down. Yeah, but you, you here's what you have. Hold on, Jerry. But one thing. He's not horrible. You cannot. You he's cannot not horrible. Of Jordan Love. He's, he's, he's putting the host on hold. Yeah, wait, hold on, hold on. Just Gary, just give me a second. Well, Gary, I got more to say about Jordan Love. Yeah. He is horse Gary. bleep. Gary, just hold on. Well, this is my show, Gary. Yeah, this is my that? show. This is your quarterback of the future, Packer fans. <laughs> Bravo. All right, I need another one, Dex. Right, I need another one. Here we one. go. Go, Pat, go! I'd rather have the defense play the way they did today with a loss than to win this game. I mean, I'm extremely uh, impressed. I don't know, and I'll ask you guys, it just appears that it's just not the scheme or the coach. It almost says if the individual talent is better. But I'm uh, greatly impressed, uh, especially with the loss by the. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Wait, what? he's okay. got a dad, so he's got an old school phone. Totally. First of all, which is totally. great. He's calling from his landline in his house <laughs> and pushing the numbers. Okay, is he, so wait, oh so God. so he said he'd rather the Packers have lost and showed some fight defensively than have yes. won the game. Yes, <laughs> I have no clue what he was. Yes, he also clearly has not watched any Kansas City Chiefs football this season because their offense has looked bad all year. Oh, oh my God. My God, yeah, he dude. thought that they're like the <laughs> 75 Steelers. Yeah. I would dude, ra- we is... have Mean Joe Green. <laughs> wow. Epic, dude. All okay. right. All right, Judd, back to you. Back to uh, Viking statements here. I, I wish I could hit, hit a phone. <laughs> I wish I could hit 555. Five, five. Oh, my God. That's 651. So, yeah, that's uh, great. Uh, yeah, dude, yeah that's 646. <laughs> okay, uh, to, provi- to provide some context to, to the offensive disaster that took place for just a huge portion of the game in Baltimore on Sunday, here's my statement. It's a statement of fact. Adam Thielen had two receptions for six yards, or to give it context, only one more reception and one more yard than tight end Luke Stocker, who many of you have never heard of before, did in the same game. I still don't know if that's a real guy. Like I don't, yeah, I, I don't I, believe it. He's caught a couple passes this year. I must have missed them. I don't know. He I watch one, I, very intricately every game. I, he sounds like the boyfriend on a sitcom show that's there Luke for like Stocker? three episodes or something, yeah. and then he's off the show. You know, like just a distraction. They kill him off. Right? Yeah, yeah. They get killed. Luke's off. dead. Oh no! Right. Let's write a Luke storyline. Yeah. <laughs> but Lou, I believe Luke Stocker's first game being active, if I'm not mistaken, was last Sunday night against the Cowboys. But anyway, just the context there. Think about that. Adam Thielen. Two receptions, six yards. Luke Stocker, one for five yards. That's what we're dealing with here. And that's not getting into what Phil brought up about Conklin's targets. Uh, Jefferson catching a 50-yard touchdown pass, and then I believe catching two more passes the rest of the day for a total of 19 yards. That's just one morsel, one example of what the Vikings are doing to forget self-scout. Self sabotage themselves. Yeah. They are right. self sabotaging. I'm going to piggyback. I'm going to piggyback here. Off All right. Uh, off of your point about offensive ineptitude, two offensive sequences yesterday told you everything you need to know about Mike Zimmer, Clint Kubiak, Kirk Cousins as a dynamic offensive trio. All right. So with a 14 point lead in the first half on the road, kind of a, just a surprisingly great start, right? You got. You've got this team on the ropes early, and now you've got the ball back, a chance to expand on a 14-point lead. Here it is, guys. Freaking stick. I think this was, might have been after the Bynum interception. I'm trying to think of the timing. It was. But like, it they, was. Okay, so they get the ball right. back, and they're ready. Like, dude, step on their throats. Go up by three touchdowns. Just, just throttle this team right now. And they come out of the gate with a tight end screen to Conklin that gets basically nothing. A handoff to Alex Madison. So, again, chance to step on a team's throat. And, like, Alex Madison's in the game? He's, he's good, but, like, why, 
Why is that? This is a pivotal point in the game. Why is Dalvin Cook not in the game to ensure that you're going to score a touchdown here, right? And then they bring Dalvin Cook back on third down, and they run the ball on third and short, and he gets stuffed. And you give the ball right back to the Ravens. And it was at that moment, as soon as they threw the tight end screen and handed off to Madison, I'm like, wow, they're literally waving the white flag. They're literally going full conservative because in, in Zimmer's mind, and probably in Kubiak's mind, it's less about stomping on this team's head and getting a 14-point lead to 21. And it's more about, let's not do anything crazy here. Let's not give the ball back on a pick six or something. Like, they're thinking what bad things could happen, as opposed to, okay, how can we get Justin Jefferson open again for some sort of 50-yard bomb? Uh, and that, so that was the first one. The second one came after Anthony Barr's clutch, ridiculous interception, right? Uh, I think somebody might have just fallen through is the that, ceiling is that, there. Is that Packer vent line? Is sure that, those happening. little guys up there? Yeah. Like the toilet flush. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm at You're my in-laws field. right now, and there's just noise. Um, so Barr picks off a pass, <laughs> and the Vikings need like 20 yards, maybe 25 to get into field goal range. And they go swing pass to Dalvin, nothing. Second and long run. This is late yeah. in the game, right? Second and long run, nothing. Overtime. Yeah, and right. then a third and long debacle because it's like third and yeah. 10 or third and 12. And now the defense is coming at you, right? Just like the least creative, most conservative crap in the most key moments of this game. And those two drives right there, like there's nothing else you need to know. Those are like, here it is, guys. Chance to throw some haymakers. Ooh, tight end screen. Ooh, swing pass. Handoff up the middle. It's like no Justin Jefferson, no Adam Thielen, nothing dynamic. Mind-blowing. All right. This is, we're, we're just, look at us. We're just firing on all cylinders right here. I'll, I'll piggyback off that, too, because my statement is when you have a chance at the kill shot, you go for the kill shot. So you're you're on the road here. This is you have you have you have figured out a way to after blowing your lead, still figuring out a way to win this game, and you could go for two points. You could go for two because basically you need a win today. Don't don't play for the tie. You're playing to lose in that situation. You need you can have you have a chance to get a big win on the road and basically save your season. And instead, Mike Zimmer goes for the PAT. And when asked about it. Here's what he said. After the game tying touchdown, did you give any thought um, to going for two or was it? Yeah, I thought about it. Um, you know, <clears throat> they had a heck of a kicker. Still had, you know, over a minute left and three timeouts, I believe it was. Okay, Zim. My guy. I know Justin Tucker is like the best kicker in the world. He hit like a 66-yarder earlier this season to dagger the Lions. But here's what I don't get. Zimmer just gave a kicker credit there, right? He literally just put trust into another kicker. And instead of instead, you wanted to just play for a tie, which is a losing mentality. Dan Campbell has the stones to go for two. Dan Campbell. And at different circumstances, but similar that you're on the road and you need to win today. And Mike Zimmer, for whatever reason, is too scared to do it. I think you should have went for two. I really think you should have done it, and you could have gotten the win. Well, okay, let's unpack this. So his logic doesn't make sense. I'm not necessarily saying he should have gone for two. Like, I understand... With the NFL's overtime rules, like, all right, let's tie it. Maybe we get the coin toss or whatever. Like, you know, would I have loved it if he went for two? Yes. Am I going to demand that he should have gone for two? No. But when he says, well, they have a really good kicker. And, uh, and so that's why we... Well, but their kicker can also win the game when it's tied. Like, he can yes. win the game whether they're losing or tied in that also spot. Yeah, so his, his, his logic didn't make any sense. No, but I, but you know what, Phil, to go back to after the Bynum pick, and you are at the 16, and you have a chance, as, as you said, to step on a team's throat. How does this coaching staff preach with a straight face to its players? You know, we got to get out, out of these close – quit playing close games. Like, we got to win – they've literally told them, and they're right, but they've told the players, you know, we have to – we can't make every game so close. And then – when you got a chance to take the kill shot on the road, which you unequivocally should do, you as a coaching staff say, we can't do that. So how do the players process, okay, hold on a second. We're supposed to create more separation and potentially win games big, and you don't give us the chance to. Mm -hmm. So, like, what's the response? See, that this, again, is where I just think the coaching staff has lost this group. There's no credibility there then. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so again, so let me go back to this one nugget and then we, we got to get to our guy. Uh, I'm hoping he's okay. Oh I, God. I don't know. I don't know. Randy and Cottage Grove. Might be resigned at this point. 
I don't know. Or just drunk. He's probably still drunk. Mm -hmm. But the last two weeks, however it needs to happen, how do you go? So Tyler Conklin has 14 targets the last two weeks. Justin Jefferson has nine. And by the way, I think there's more than, I think there's even more targets in the universe for Justin Jefferson than just robbing Tyler Conklin of them. But how do you go from, let's get, let's get five to eight of those Tyler Conklin targets and get them to Justin Jefferson. Is it scheme? Is it cousins? Like they're going to say, well, offensive line, this, that is such a cop out. And Alex Boone told us last Tuesday, is the offensive line amazing? No. Are the pockets still mostly clean? Like 60 to 65% clean? Yes. There's time. That throw to Jefferson for a touchdown. Yeah, I think the Vikings and some fans would want you to believe that, well, that's only there like once every lunar eclipse. No, that plays there multiple times a game if they want it to be, if they want to take some risks. Yeah. So, so how do you get five or six or eight targets from your backup tight end over to one of the best receivers in the NFL? That's how you avoid close games. So It's not so that hard. It's third down, I believe, o OT after the bar pick, which, by the way, if you're the Vikings, is a must score. I cannot ask my defense to go out there again and stop Lamar Jackson when they are at 80-plus plays. Like, they are gas. They're done. Barr has given us a gift. You have to score. Field goal. Wins it. You leave with a win. And the Ravens do no disguise and show blitz. So on third down, everybody is coming up. Kirk Cousins can see it. And I don't know if this is all Kirk. I don't know if it's Clinton Kirk. I don't know whom. But how do you not check into an appropriate play? Kirk Cousins literally dropped back with the design play and threw the ball into the ground because he was scared. Mm -hmm. Because, But that they showed full blitz. Like this whole league is about, at that point in time, it's snap second, adjusting. Okay, we're changing. Kill, kill, kill. That's a, Je that's a Jefferson shot right there. Mm -hmm. they, everybody's coming. Nobody's left, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And they still ran the design play. Yep. Who and is that? And, and, and the how? And the defenders are going to tell you, well, what's he supposed to do? There's pressure in his face. Watch other NFL games. But the pressure. Watch other NFL games. There's pressure in every quarterback's well, face in those situations. But it's telegraphed. What he's supposed to do is crystal clear. At the line of scrimmage, you check into another play yes. that fr that frees up a receiver who's by the way who by the way is going to be free down the field, right? Yeah. All right, we're going to collect ourselves here for a second. See if our guy Randy. In Cottage Grove is uh, alive and breathing. And we'll get some bonus statements later. Don't forget Vikings Vent Line on Purple Daily from last night if you want just a good, like, 90-minute therapy session. Mackie and Judd, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment.